with a comet scheduled by British Overseas Airways Corporation to start the world's first jet passenger air service. Pathy News detailed cameraman Sid Baines to cover the historic trip. This is his story. A few minutes ago, I boarded the comet together with other passengers making the trip to Johannesburg. Captain Philip Brentnall took us off with Flying Officer Charlebois, known to everybody as Charlie Boy, as co-pilot. Nice. Up to 40,000 we shot to reach the comet's best operating height and headed for Rome, our first scheduled stop. Then I began to realize what a wonderful ship this was. Like all usual cameramen, flying is no novelty to me, but this was something new. There just wasn't any vibration. Before I'd really settled down, we were flying over the Alps. I think I got a shot of the Matterhorn over there. Skipper Brentnall pointed out Corsica, that large mass of land 70 miles away. At our great flying speed, we were soon on the last few miles to Rome. In a few minutes, Peter Panario was asking permission to land. We were over Rome. There was an hour's refueling break scheduled. I chartered a chariot for a quick look see. I got as far as the Colosseum where lions used to eat Christians. They tell me you ought to see it by moonlight. Unfortunately, we were due to take off at six. As a matter of fact, I only just made it. The jets were warming up. Next stop, Beirut, Syria, then Khartoum, both of which I didn't see as we passed through during the night. But with daylight, we were headed for Uganda in East Africa. Tony Smith, our navvy, was busy. At our height and speed, calculations have to be bang on. We were looking out for Lake Vic As she served breakfast, she's always saying, everything's fine. The comet was riding as smoothly as a bird. But I soon had to get cracking again to catch the first sight of the Victoria Falls on the mighty Zambezi River, wider than Niagara, and twice its drop. We were heading in for Livingston Airport now. Johnny Johnson's engines had served us well. This was the last stop before Joburg. a fantastic city built out of the riches of the great Rand gold mines. Those white patches are the waste soil after the gold is extracted. And then we were landing. Britain had made air history again. The world now had its first passenger jet air service. Nearly 7,000 miles by jet. The ships of May that we learned that Yoke Peter, the first of the comets, had crashed into the Mediterranean off Elba with the loss of 35 lives. Yoke Peter took off from Rome Airport on schedule. A few minutes later, the plane exploded. The ships of the Royal Navy hastened to the spot, but there were no survivors. Immediately, BOAC grounded all comets and the search began for the wreckage. Thus, the most extensive investigation of its kind ever held was started. Naval units under the command of Admiral Earl Mountbatten gave every assistance to salvage fragments from the seabed. The pieces of the plane were taken back to Britain and slowly Yoke Peter was reconstructed. And although the wreckage was scattered over a wide area, 
80% of the plane was pieced together. Meanwhile, other exhaustive tests were being carried out at Farnborough. Another comet, Yoke Uncle, was to be placed within a giant tank of water and there tested until destroyed. Suitably ballasted, the plane was completely enclosed by the tank, which is about 112 feet long and 16 feet deep. 200,000 gallons of water were poured in. A further 100 gallons were forced into the fuselage to place a strain on it equivalent to that encountered in actual flight. The next step was to test the wings. Automatically controlled jacks moved them up and down. Yoke Uncle endured the test for the equivalent of 15,000 hours flying time. The water tank test finally caused a failure in the fuselage. A point of high stress at the corner of an escape hatch failed and the rent developed. This, the experts say, is a result of metal fatigue. Similar traces were found on the wreckage of Yoke Peter. BOAC have high hopes that the comets will soon fly again and that comets two and... Okay, well, maybe a bit of a macabre way to uh, start off for our third uh, third week together. But um, it's the story of the de Havilland Comet. If you fly out of State College, you fly... If you fly on um, uh, United, you fly on a de Havilland Dash, now a Bombardier. I guess they've been bought out. Um, but I was surprised that, that, that uh, this was the um, the world's first uh, jet airliner. A very elegant plane with uh, the four engines actually ensconced within the wings. Um, a beautiful plane, but it had this uh, one uh, problem is that a lot of the flights, or not a lot of them, but some of the flights didn't actually make it to their, their destinations. And uh, what was happening, uh, you saw in the, the tank experiment, was that um, in taking off and landing many times, and with a pressurized cabin, that you raise it to, or you keep it at atmospheric pressure, even as the pressure outside goes down to, as we saw yesterday, at 10,000 meters, something like uh, 30 kPa instead of 100 kPa at uh, sea level. The uh, pressures that are put in there, there cyclically uh, had a problem with um, metal fatigue. So metal fatigue is when you take a piece of metal, you bend it, it doesn't break the first time, but when you've uh, twisted it 50 times, 100 times, 10,000 times, it finally dis, uh, disintegrates or breaks into two. And so with these comets, they actually had square windows, a stress concentration in the square. That's why you have round windows in planes typically. And the, the fatigue cracks would grow from the corners, and then all of a sudden uh, you'd be flying along and there would be uh, a kind of catastrophic uh, decompression in the, in the plane. Um, not a completely new phenomenon. April 28, 1988, when a 737 famously lost part of its fuselage. Uh, um, and this is uh, much more recent. This is in the late 1980s, I think. Uh, sorry? Yeah, Hawaii flight. Going. So these uh, flights go between the islands, so they're up and down all the time. I don't know, it's probably a 15, 20-minute flight. So it goes up to 20,000 feet down, does this 10 times a day more. And exactly the same problem um, uh, because combination, I think, of salt air corrosion, uh, even on aluminum, and, um, and the, this multiple stressing. And so this was a 737 that was uh, going between the islands, and all of a sudden, as it was flying just at... The front part of the fuselage unzipped. Amazingly, as you see in this, it unzipped, but uh, I think it took one of the flight attendants out, which is tragic, of course, but everyone else uh, survived and ultimately landed. But exactly the same problem. And so I'm not doing this to be macabre. Uh, I guess I'm doing it for a couple of reasons. One is to understand, as engineers and scientists, uh, our responsibility to society, public good. And so uh, although it seems a little far away from us, these designs, um, they're things that you ultimately will end up doing in some way, not maybe for aircraft, but maybe for structures that are equally uh, vulnerable and um, important. Uh, and it is making the uh, point, I think, that uh, although we've looked at fluid pressures at a point, no pun intended, um, what we'll do now is we'll look at fluid structures and fluid pressures on surfaces and to be able to resolve forces, to be able to understand something about uh, designing things. We won't design things in this class, uh, but we'll try and uh, uh, understand exactly what's going on enough to be able to allow you to, to do that. Perhaps something a bit closer to home. I don't know if the uh, sound is off or on. I'll put the sound off. 
this should come on. Uh, you know, structures which are maybe closer to things that you might think about are uh, dams for hydropower generation. This is some CCT footage from Russia. Um, of course, you work with uh, large pressures of water behind the dam that goes through a uh, pump room. I'm a boy. <laughs> what are you? <laughs> so you work with large pressures behind the dam. Uh, it goes through generators at uh, a lower base level. The whole idea is to take the potential energy of the water, turn it into kinetic energy, and turn that kinetic energy into electrical energy. When things go wrong and you don't close the doors uh, properly, then all of a sudden you have uh, incidents happening like you just saw, which I think you uh, understand from the, um, uh, the footnotes on the bottom that it killed 70 or so people uh, because something went awry. Large pressure is not accounted for. Sometimes those things occur not just with the failure of a gate into the turbines that escapes into the power hall and kills people, but uh, when dams fail completely. Malpasse Dam was a, a sentinel uh, failure. It's in the south of France, uh, a beautiful arched dam, Finskin Dam. The abutments moved once they filled it up with water and the dam fractured and it uh, washed out two uh, cities downstream, you see, killing 423 people. Uh, not quite as dramatic in some way as comets dropping out of the sky, uh, de Havilland comets <coughs> dropping out of the sky, but many more uh, fatalities. And also the Vion Dam, which was close to this. This was 19, late 1950s. Vion Dam was uh, 1963, I think. But a beautiful arch dam, a big rock uh, wall in the Italian Alps that was slowly moving. They filled the dam up. It rained. The rock wall started moving faster, and it just slid into the dam completely filled the dam. The dam was absolutely intact, but it washed a wall of water over the top of the dam. This is a picture of the dam on the right-hand side today, um, but washed a wall of water across the top of it and uh, washed away uh, people living downstream in, in, uh, in, um, in, uh, in, a couple, in villages. And finally, I guess, yeah, two more minutes. Why not get us this, just in terms of historic perspective here? And so, so sometimes dams you want to destroy. And so this is the dam busters from uh, the Second World War, maybe 1943. The idea is that for a war effort for Nazi Germany, you have to be able to make things like, what are the critical parts of the war effort? Maybe ball bearings. If you want to have tanks or trucks, you need to have ball bearings. Ball bearings are energy intensive. So if you can destroy the energy supply that supplies that, then you're ahead of something. So the idea is... In this particular case, the Ruhr in Germany, most of the uh, energy supply was by uh, hydroelectric dams. And so it's not very easy to take out a dam, even though we've seen two that actually failed on their own. And so the idea here is, how do you, how do you take a dam out? Uh, not such a strange thing. Certainly now, if you go to Hoover Dam, uh, instead of being able to drive on the top, there's a, a bridge that takes you off the dam. And the reason for that is that they don't want people blowing up dams uh, in this day and age, you know, post 9-11. Uh, and so the idea here is to get a bomb and to have that bomb bounce down the <coughs> reservoir and so that it ends up landing at the dam, sinks to the bottom of the water at the dam uh, at its foot where there's some confinement and then everyone flies off and then it goes off. And so these were the trials to be able to try and make it do exactly that. They tested it out on uh, some locks in uh, Scotland to be able to try and uh, get it right and to get it at the right place. Uh, they found out that they had to put some spin on it to be able to get it to do exactly what you wanted to do. It's just like skipping a stone across the water, which many, all of you, I hope, would have done um, in your lifetimes. And uh, the idea was to be able to, to get rid of these dams. And so I think out of uh, four dams attacked, three were uh, breached, or three dams attacked, two were breached. Um, with net result, that uh, electricity production is down and... Uh, it speeds the uh, the end of the, the war as it was then, which I guess is now uh, finished uh, 70 odd years ago now. So where is this? Yeah, so I don't know. Yeah, I guess in this one they don't show the end results of, of the actual um, raids. But in all of these, what they have in common uh, is something about fluid pressures that are applied on structures. The comet failed because it had a fluid pressure 
gas pressures on inside and outside that were too large for the strength of the material. Um, the kind of civilian dams failed because they had a pressure which was large enough for the too large for the foundation to be able to withstand it. Or uh, in one case, I guess it didn't really fail; it was just overtopped. And in the case of these, um, uh, the bouncing bombs, the idea is to get it not to hit the dam with something and just take the top out, but to actually get it down to the bottom of the dam where it has some confinement because of the water around it, and then to have the explosion have some effect. It's the same as if you drill a hole to put uh, an explosive in the ground as a blast hole if you're mining, you put stemming in it. You fill it all the way up to the top so the blast is contained 10, 20, 30 feet down. Uh, rather than just blowing out through the, the hole that you made. And so the, the common theme here, if you like, is that we're trying to, to understand something about fluid pressures on structures. Well, if someone's viewing online, they won't be able to see us today, I fear, because I tried to get on. But, uh, so anyway, so I guess if we're not on, we're not on. So that's kind of the theme for today. Uh, so what are we going to do? So what, uh, well, actually, this is the theme. I'll go back. So this is kind of where we are. So we'll take off from where we are. I said last time we'd talk about fluid dynamics. We don't. We'll talk about that when we talk about Bernoulli in a week's time. But we'll spend this week really talking about um, understanding fluid pressures on, on structures. So not just as a, at a point, as we learned last time about going up and down. Uh, pressures horizontally are, are the same. Um, if it's evacuated, then it's the vapor pressure we worry about. And also, if we go up and down in a gas, then we don't care so much about unit weight changes, be t typically, because compared to the, the fluid, the liquid rather, then the, the, the pressure change is not very large. So what can we do with uh, some of these to be able to say something about these very simple systems that we've looked at? Well, one, one very easy way to look at this is let's just um, go with this idea that we first looked at of the, um, the, the comets. And so this is, what is it, week three, session one, fluid pressures on structures, really, I guess, is really what we're interested in. Sometimes on structures, just sometimes just an interest in what they, they might be. And so let's look very quickly at the comet just to get a feel of what we might want to, to look at. And so this is the situation you have. And it's a situation you'll find yourself in every time you fly in a plane. Pressure in the fuselage, pressure in the atmosphere, and they're typically different. Pressure in the fuselage is typically of the order of atmospheric, right? Because you don't want your uh, ears to pop. If we are at 10,000 meters, we saw last time that because of this, the weight of air underneath us, uh, we find that if we're at 10,000 meters, we're at something like uh, 30 kilopascals. And so we want to be able to design this fuselage, even though none of us are aeronautical engineers, or maybe we are, I don't know, I'll speak for myself only, to see what the strength of the material is or how thick the fuselage would be to be able to accommodate that. Um, I happen to have looked up that the, the strength, if you like, almost like surface tension, the strength of uh, aluminum is something of the order of 200 megapascals. And so, how do we figure out exactly how thick to make the fuselage? And we can call that thickness, I don't know, call it T. Not to be confused with time, but let's call it thickness. And maybe this is the diameter of the fuselage, which I don't know, it's probably less than 10 meters, certainly less than 10 meters for it to happen, right? 30, 10 meters is 30 feet. And so, the essence of this class. Uh, or this portion of the class, is to try and figure out exactly what this thickness might be. And to do that, the easiest way to do it is to think of this as 
uh, resolving forces applied on a structure. So let's take um, the fuselage and cut it in half. So all I'm going to do is cut it straight through the middle. And so it has some, some length. And we could call that length L, or, or it could be 1 for that matter. And all I want to do is make it into a free body. And the free body is this pressure that's acting in here, which is equal to the pressure of the fuselage. I've kind of run out of space up here, but you could imagine me drawing the opposite pressure. So that really the free body I'm doing is something that looks like this. And I'm I'm making it a, a square. And so this is the pressure that's acting in the atmosphere. This is the pressure that's acting in the fuselage. And so really it's just a differential between those. And what's holding the fuselage together is this load that I'll define here, which is, I'm just going to call it F. It's a force. And so that's just the free body that defines this system. And so if it's, if it's in equilibrium, as we've talked about, so we've talked about Newton's second law. There are no accelerations, static. So just sum of forces has to equal zero. We're only interested in resolving the forces uh, that are vertical. And so if we do that, then what would it be? It would be 2 times F has to equal the difference between the pressure in the fuselage minus the atmospheric pressure. Bless you, yeah. Multiplied by the area on which it acts. And the area on which it acts is the diameter of the fuselage multiplied by the length of the uh, length of that portion of fuselage. The force, when it fails, is going to, uh, this is equal to the force. So the force, when it fails, is equal to the stress that's applied multiplied by the area, which is equal to the stress that's applied times the area of this little portion here, right? So this will be the thickness of the fuselage multiplied by its length, L. So this is length times the thickness on one side. And so if we substitute this in here, we end up with two times the stress, the strength rather, the length of the fuselage, the thickness of the fuselage. Hello! The difference between the pressures should check if I turn my phone off, I guess, as well. If I'm getting smart about this. The diameter of the plane and the length. Get rid of this. Get rid of this. And we can just rearrange that in terms of the thickness of the fuselage. And it's something like uh, this expression here. The difference between the pressures. Of course, if there's no difference in pressures and you wear oxygen masks in the plane, we don't have to worry about this. It could be much weaker. The diameter of the plane divided by two times the strength. And you can put some numbers in this. Well, let's ignore the fact that at 10,000 uh, meters, it's 30 kPa. Let's assume it's zero. So order of magnitude, this is 10 to the 5 uh, newtons per meter squared times the diameter, which is 10 to the 1 divided by 2 times, we said it's 200, whoops, times 10 to the 6 newtons per meter squared. And if I do that, it's some, this is 400 times 10 to the 6, so it's something like 1 over 400, just doing this, and it's 10 to the 6 divided by 10 to the 6. 
and you can check the units, but there should be some excess of the only units. This is pressures, this is pressures, stress, so the units only left are meters. So one four hundredth of a meter, a hundredth of a meter is a centimeter, so it's a quarter of a centimeter. So it's about 2.5 millimeters. So that sounds about right. I've never really felt the, uh, the thickness of a plane. Certainly it's not the thickness you see when you look out of the window, which is probably about three, you know, three inches or seven centimeters. The skin of a plane is probably yeah, a couple of millimeters thick and made out of aluminum thickly. So what we've done is we've done a very simple calculation. Uh, we've taken our thoughts of fluid pressures and we've integrated them in some way or multiplied them to be able to get uh, pressure to a point to pressure over an area, made assumptions about that pressure over an area to get a force. We've resolved forces and we've come up, come up with some kind of rudimentary design at least to be able to say something useful about our system that if we didn't have to worry about fatigue, then we could say something about what the, the thickness of the, the fuselage of a plane should be. And so what inadvertently we've done, we've done a number of things uh, without perhaps thinking about them. One, we've taken a pressure distribution. We've done three things. Uh, actually, I'll write on the same slide so we don't have to go off it. We've done three things. The first is that we've um, taken a pressure distribution a very simple one, a uniform one, which we said, and we've converted that into a series of what we call uh, resultant forces. And so it's resultant forces that we've used to resolve the forces pulling down on the sides of the fuselage, the force, net force going up due to the distribution of pressure, and we've resolved exactly what that magnitude is. So we've figured out exactly what this resultant force is. We're going to find out that in the things that we do, we can define this resultant force by a very simple expression, which is the area that it's applied over, the unit weight of the fluid, and the depth of the centroid of that straight plane. Don't worry about it for now, but that's what we're going to find out. So at least we've figured out exactly what the resultant forces are in this system. Two, um, we have defined where the force acts. We haven't really in this particular case, right? It's just simply resolved. We have a net pressure acting upwards inside the fuselage. We have a net pressure acting uniformly downwards outside the fuselage, the atmospheric uh, pressure effect. And we have forces on the sides acting downwards. And so we don't really know exactly where this force acts, but we don't need to because we're just resolving vertically. We, we don't have to take moments about this. If we had to take moments, we'd have to figure out exactly where this force is acting. Actually, just from this distribution, the fact that this pressure is uniform, you would guess that the point of action of this force would be dead set in the middle of this component. And likewise, the point of action of this force acting here would also be dead set in the middle of this. And so we haven't needed it for this calculation, but for some calculations, we probably do need that. And so, although we really haven't done number two, we would like to know where this force acts. That's going to be one of our tasks. And the third one, which I suppose we have done, we've defined a failure mode. And in other words, we've said that when the strength of the fuselage is exceeded, by the stresses that are applied on it. We kind of did that here by making this. This is the strength of the fuselage, and we're equating it to the stress that's applied. We said that when those are equal, it's gone. The, you can't sustain it anymore, and the, the fuselage will, will pop or unzip. And so these are the three things that we'll talk about this week that are very important. Uh, we want to be able to figure out exactly what the forces are that are applied on a, uh, a structure. It may be a plane structure or it may be a curved structure. We want to be able to figure out exactly where it acts because sometimes things fail not just in this um, uh, one-dimensionally resolved mode but by moments. Um, and so to do that, we use a very simple expression which basically says that the moment applied to a structure 
is equal to the sum of the resultant forces multiplied by a lever arm. Force times a length equals a moment. And we can use that to figure out exactly where that force acts. And then once we know where all magnitudes of all the forces and where they act, we can then do the third part, is we can define a mode of failure and see whether it will fail or not. And so that is not, the third one is not so obvious, maybe from what we've talked about for this particular example. But if we go back to the, to the dam example, um, uh, we can make a very simple illustration. And that is that if you think of the dam as looking like this, and we know that the pressure distribution acting on the back looks like this. This is the water level in the, in the dam. Then we know that we can calculate a resultant force that acts somewhere. We, we know that we can also calculate the weight of the dam that acts somewhere. And very simplistically, if we want to know whether this dam will physically fall over, um, if we happen to know where this acts, as we'll try and do today, and we happen to know, many of you will know it acts two-thirds of the way down the height of this. Many of you also know that this acts one-third away from this back face, just by what you might know already from your mechanics uh, stuff. Then if we draw a revised dam that looks like this, and we know that the resultant force here acts through this point. We know that the weight also acts through this point. Then, uh, without going into great detail, well, you, can, you, you know this, right? If the resultant of those actually exists, this is, this is the, the resultant of these two. So I guess F final. You know that F final is equal to the horizontal resultant squared plus the vertical resultant squared square root, right? It's just Pythagoras. You know that. And so we can calculate what this resultant is, but that's not really what's interesting to us. If we know, for instance, if this resultant acts inside the toe of the dam, then the forces can't overturn. If the resultant happens to act outside that, then all of a sudden it's able to topple over, and that would be one failure mode. So that's what we mean when we're talking about these three things. One, what are the magnitudes of the forces? How big is FR? How big is W? If we know what those are, we can calculate the magnitude of the forces. We want to know, to be able to draw this diagram here, though, we need to know exactly where those forces act, the second part of what we're trying to do. And we can do that by taking moments. We don't need to do that here, but we, we can do it by taking moments. And the third part, if we know exactly where both of them act, or all the forces on the structure act, we can do some calculation to figure out whether it will fail or not. So that's the underlying theme of what we're attempting to, to do today. Okay? So it can get a bit hairy, uh, but let's try uh, making the first stab at answering the first question. How big is the force? Resultant. So that's the first question. And so one way to, to do that is to draw a diagram. Uh, we won't use the, the exact way they do it in the book because it's a bit maybe over long. So here's a diagram that I'll try and draw as, as well as I can. So it's a picture of a plane, a plate that we're just putting in water. It could be this, I guess. The water surface is going to be here. We're going to have the plate vertical, and we're going to look at the pressures that act on this plate. Nothing more than that. 
And so the diagram that we want to have to be able to represent that is that we could draw as we go down uh, in depth on this plate. So this is the plate I'm trying to draw. It's of some width w, uh, which is this length here. It varies between some. This is the y. We said we we're going to use z vertically, but forget that for today. We're going to use y vertically. This is the pressure distribution. And the pressure is equal to unit weight times y, right? This, this curve here. And so if we take a very small slither of this length here, this is y equals y1. This is y equals y0, not g0, which in this case we're taking 0. That's the, the free surface. And this little portion here will be equal to what? You know that we have to do this. A differential component dy. And so the other important thing to look at is the magnitude of this component here. This is going to have a pressure acting on it. And so the force acting on this is going to be the pressure multiplied by this particular distance here multiplied by W. So the force acting with every single portion on this is going to be, we can, we can calculate directly from this. Anything else I've missed on this di diagram? Yeah. Well, let's just do this. And so the, I guess the other thing that we can do is that this is going to be a change in area is going to be equal to the width times dy, right? So dy is just the thickness of this portion, the stripe, if you like, on the, on the plane that we're putting in the water. We know that as we look down here, the pressure at the top is zero and it increases uh, linearly so that it's some larger magnitude at the bottom, this triangular distribution. And all we want to do is we want to calculate what the total magnitude of the force acting on this plane is. So how do we do that? We take uh, the resultant force is equal to the sum of the pressure times the area over which it acts. We've already done that. If we write that in a differential way, we can write that as an integral of the pressure multiplied by uh, dA, which is the same as the integral of the pressure times the width times the distance. We have limits at the bottom of the top of y0 and y1. And we also know that the pressure acting at any point is equal to the unit weight times y. And so this pressure is also equal to the unit weight times y. And so if we write that out in longhand, we have an integral between y0 and y1. We make this substitution which is equal to the unit weight times y times w times dy. So this is the area, this is the pressure, and pressure, so if you like, this is the pressure, this is the area, and so really we're just reverting to this. And if we do that uh, integration, uh, are we missing another y? No, no, we're not missing another y. And so if we do that integration, what do we end up getting? The components we can take outside, which are constant, is the unit weight, the width, uh, the integral is going to be a half y squared evaluated between those limits of y0 and y1, 
which is going to be the, in, the magnitude is going to be the unit weight times the width. I'm going to write this as y. Uh, well, so this is 0. So we could do this, and we'd end up with y squared. But I'm going to write it slightly differently as equal to uh, an area multiplied by what's the other one? A half y. And so you can check whether that's correct. I could have written it up as a half y squared. I guess this would be y1 squared, right? Because this limit is 0, this limit is y1. And so my reason for writing it that way is that I can now rewrite this, which tends out to be an absolutely general relationship. The unit weight, what is this term wy1? This is the area of this plate. <coughs> the width multiplied by the distance between these two, since this one intersects the surface. And the other component is half the height of the sample. And so I'm going to replace this term here, a half 1, y1, by h sub c. And h sub c is the depth of the centroid. of the plate. So, terrible handwriting, I'm afraid, but I'm, I'll say it as well. Depth of centroid of the plate. So this is an absolutely general relationship that you can use for any plane, uh, any shaped plane surface. We've done it for one that intersects the surface, so this is our free surface, but it could also be at some depth below that, and this, this relationship would still hold. It says that the force that's acting on this is given by these three components. The unit weight of the fluid that it's sitting in, liquid. It's given by the area of this. So the area is the width times its height, which you can calculate, of this thing. It can be at this orientation, or it can be inclined. still doesn't matter. The area of this can still be the same. And it's multiplied by the depth of the centroid. So the centroid of a, a shape is its balance point, right? For Pennsylvania, it's Pennsylvania, the center, center of Pennsylvania is here, of course, right? State College, that's why they put it here. Equally inacceptable, inaccessible to everybody. Um, and so, but physically what that is, it's the place that it'd be the balance point of this. So the centroid of the plane of which you want to calculate the pressure acting is this H sub C. And that's always true. For a plane uh, structure, that's always going to be the case. Yeah? The plate. <coughs> plate, yeah. It's, hor it's horrible, isn't it? <coughs> plate, yeah. And so that's always true. And so if you think about that, you could rationalize it uh, based on this. So why, why is that the case? Um, let's try drawing a, a, another diagram. I guess I'll draw this kind of in perspective. So now this is a plate that's inclined. It's good to get a feel for why this is the case. That expression we've written is always true. You can always use it on a plane structure. Why is it true? So let's take this plate, let's incline it. That's kind of an isometric view of that plate that we're drawing here. But then let's draw it just side on. So this is the isometric view of it. This is what we've called x. This is what we've called y. We could draw it side on, and it would look like this. Trying to make it a, a thick plate. That's supposed to be just a straight line. What's the pressure that's acting on that plate? Well, we think that at the top it would be some magnitude. It would be given by this depth of the fluid. The depth of the fluid down to this point multiplied by unit weight would give us the pressure here. And likewise, the pressure acting at this point would be the depth of the fluid multiplied by its unit weight, which would be a bigger number, right? Because it's deeper. And so we have those two anchor points. If we went halfway between those, the depth between these two is halfway between these two depths. And so the magnitude of the pressure at the halfway point would be half of that difference. 
So the pressure distribution between those points has to be um, a straight line. It's linearly varying, if you like. And so why is it then that the, uh, the pressure given on this plate, or the force acting on this plate, is given by the area of the plate, which would be this area here, by the way, the unit weight of the fluid, which would be this fluid here, and the depth of the centroid. Where's the depth of the centroid for this plate? Right? What we just said. So the depth of the centroid of the plate doesn't change whether it's vertical or horizontal or inclined. So it's going to be this, this balance point, which is the middle. So in other words, just draw this, and, and the place where you, it should balance is there. And so the rationale of this is that the balance point of this plate has to be right in the middle. And so physically, uh, don't do that. Uh, you know where this is going. If we draw a line across the middle and come here and go up here, we know that this, subtracting this volume here and adding this volume here gives just a uniform distribution of pressure on the plate. And therefore, by doing that, it's basically saying we're taking the average pressure distribution, we're multiplying it by the area, and that gives us the total force. The average pressure distribution, of course, is this, right? A unit weight times the location of that is, if you like, the average pressure distribution multiplied by the area. So don't be hoodwinked by the fact that we've done some calculus to get here. There's a, a very sound physical reason for this being the case. And that is that uh, the centroid um, of the plate is the place where it would give us the average pressure that's acting on this plate, by definition. And if we can calculate that just by calculating the height of that point below the surface, then an average pressure acting on the plate multiplied by the area of the plate gives us the force. So that's it. So that's the first of our three things that we like to do with this. And so we, we can always use this expression. Everyone's blipping away today. Um, so that's the first thing. So what was the second? So where does FR act? So you've learned one thing so far today. We can get the, take the average pressure on a plate, multiply it by the air, that gives us the force of that comes Point number one. Point number two, the pressure does not act at the centroid. It does not act at the centroid. So in some cases, it migrates towards the centroid, but usually it acts below the centroid. And so the reason, so that's something that you should uh, also put in your minds. You could also work that out kind of um, uh, heuristically, I guess, or inductively, if you think about what the distribution of pressure is. And so the cent the so. It acts at what we'll call the center of pressure, not surprisingly. And so the question then is, how do we know exactly what this, this center of pressure would be? And so one way to be able to do that is for us to be able to take this distribution. Well, let's just do it heuristically. Um, we know that for this system that we just looked at, bless you, The pressure distribution looks something like this. And we know that that gives us a magnitude of a res resultant, which we can calculate. Um, and what we'd like to know is the depth below the surface where this resultant acts. And so one easy way to do that is just to resolve this uh, by saying that this is a force distribution that we have multiplied by the location where it acts. And so what we could do is we could apply a moment to this and we'll choose to do it at the surface at y equals zero just because it's convenient. And so you can see from this that we can write an expression that the moment has to be equal to 
the sum of the forces multiplied by a lever arm, which in this case is equal to the force R multiplied by YR. And so what, if we could calculate what this moment is by looking at this pressure distribution, if we know what this force is, then we can calculate what this magnitude is. So that's our, our next task. And I don't know if I want to bore you with the detail. Let's do it. Just, just do it quickly. And so what we're going to do is we want to say that this lever arm is equal to the moment divided by the force. We actually have a force up here, right? Um, okay. And what's that going to be? We already have this force. What's the, the moment going to be? By definition, the moment is going to be equal to a force, which is a fluid pressure multiplied by an area multiplied by a lever arm, right? And this is going to be equal to 1 over a force. Uh, let's do our substitutions. So what's pressure? We said before that pressure is equal to unit weight times y. We said before that dA is equal to the width of our plate multiplied by the change in height. If I just remind you here, right, this, this here. Good God. Um, and we got y. So let's rewrite this as our component. So uh, unit weight, we have a width, we have a y, we have a y, so we have y squared in here. Um, you know, one y from here and one y from here. Um, am I forgetting anything? A width, a y, and a dy. And we integrate between the two limits of y0 and y1. And if we do that integration, let me just check that I've got everything there that I need. I think I do. Yeah. Okay. So if we do this, we end up with 1 over the resultant force. What's this integral? It's a, a unit weight. It's a width. And it's going to be, the integral is going to be a third wide cubed it's going to be evaluated between these limits of y0 which is 0 and y1 and if we do that we end up with um, 1 over the f resultant force multiplied by unit weight width we're only going to have this value in here so it should be one-third times y times y squared. I'm just writing this out a little bit differently. And my reason for doing that is that now we're going to substitute in our resultant force, which we said was equal to what? Um, unit weight times the area of our surface multiplied by uh, y1 over 2, the depth of our centroid. And so what was the area? The area is equal to the width times y1. And so let's substitute in this. So here we have unit weight, width, height. These should both be 1s, right? And a third y1 squared. And if we divide it through by this term here, we have unit weight, we have area, which is a width times y1. You can see why I'm writing it this way. And multiplied by y1 over 2. And this is um, the depth, the point where it acts. And you so see if by magic, I can see you're captivated because you're very quiet. Get rid of this, get rid of the areas, and all of a sudden we have
which is the point where the force acts. And you know that, right? You know that if this, this is two-thirds um, y1, and you know this is one-third y1. And so we've done the first two things we talked about. We said we wanted to know what the resultant is. We know the resultant is always equal to the area of the plate we have, the average pressure that acts on that plate, the product of those two. We can get the average product by looking at the centroid of that plate. Hold on a second. This is a very important message at the end. This is a punchline. And so we can always get the force from that. But if you want to know where it acts, now this is the really cool bit, the place where it acts is the center of pressure. And the center of pressure uh, is equal to, and we're going to do this. I can do this very well and run out of time. I'm making a mess of this, but this is it. This is the pressure distribution that acts on this plate. The center of pressure acts at the centroid of the central pressure distribution. So if I could balance this triangle on my finger, it would balance two-thirds of the distance away from the thin part, one-third away from the distance of the thick part. And so physically, what this center of pressure, the location is, it's acting at the centroid of the pressure distribution, not of the plate. And so we've, we've achieved the first two goals. So remember, force, resultant force that acts, it is equal to the area of the plate multiplied by the average pressure, the average pressure is the unit weight times the location, the depth below the surface, hc vertically of the center. This expression you have right here. If you want to calculate where that force acts, because you want to do this stability analysis on the structure, we can always re resort to this idea that we can take a moment about any point. We chose this particular point. It could have been any point. And we can sum forces times the lever arm and equate that to the moment, and that gives us the point of action. Once we know the point of action of that force, we can do the third part, which we haven't done today, and that is we can look to see if this vector is inside or outside the toe of the dam, and therefore whether it falls over or not. So those are the three messages. Okay. Great. Thank you.